Even three years ago, when I looked out of my window, this is what I saw. A shed, a wall, a few buildings painted cream and red, bougainvillea flowers, vivid pink and dull orange, a huge banyan tree that on any given day might host a kingfisher bird, a coppersmith or a murder of crows. Today, when I look out of my window, this is what I see. A shed, a wall, buildings, bougainvillea flowers, a banyan tree and so much else. Because recently, after working on my book on Palava, something strange has happened in my life. This scene, so mundane and solid to the casual eye, has for me acquired a strange translucency and impermanence. When I look out now, I see the solid reality of electric wires, of dripping ACs, of brick and mortar. But beneath that, I see something else. I see the sloping roofs of a Gothic railway station and a yard crowded with bullock carts and heaped with bales of cotton. Beneath that, I see a tranquil garden that once belonged to a lady named Mrs. Huff, a great beauty who danced with the Duke of Wellington on a memorable night and owned a famous mango tree that fruited twice a year, in summer, of course, and at Christmas time. And beneath that, I see wilderness, jackals, dragonflies, and a scatter of huts that belong to the fisher folk who ventured into the deep waters. In short, I can see the past. And I see the questions and the great learnings that looking into the past has given me. When I look, it is not only when I look out of my window now that I see a different view. It is when I look outside any window that I see things that may not be visible to others. And I have started questioning so many certainties that you and I have taken for granted all these years. These are the learnings that I would like to talk to you about. The past lives on beyond, beneath the skin of the present. The view outside your window is a palimpsest. What you see today is actually built upon so many other realities. What you see today is soon going to be buried under so many other realities. And it is not always easy to excavate these layers and to reach the truth beneath. The fragments that sometimes come to us through schools, through college, through the ether, are not always the entire truth. They are half-truths. They are misleading. They are often flat and simplistic. The fragments that come to us are often based on the most insubstantial of uh, beings, stories, uh, memories, and the shifting sands of amnesia. The past is not always black and white. It is a myriad colors, brown, orange, green, pink, purple. And perhaps most importantly, the entire business of a single story and a single narrative and a single identity is a troubling one because the world is interconnected. Even the most remote part of the world, of our planet, for example, the island of Kolaba, as it was about 300 years ago, is connected with the rest of the planet. Its stories are connected with the stories of Kolaba are connected with the stories of uh, the rise of Hitler in Europe, a civil war fought a long time ago in America, um, the uh, a terrible massacre in Afghanistan, or a border built across India in 1947. These were the lessons I learned when I started exploring my patch of land. My exploration of Kolaba actually came about by chance. I am a journalist. I was a journalist for many years. And after that, I became a writer for children's books. One day, during a casual lunch with my editor, she suggested that I do a piece, a book on a neighborhood in Mumbai, any neighborhood, she said. I wasn't pleased. I was diffident. I was reluctant. I pointed out I am neither architect nor historian. She swatted away these objections as if they were pesky flies 
and urged me to take a shot at it. And by the time we had finished dessert, it had been agreed that I would write a book on Kolaba. So rather diligently, I went back home and started doing research. And I think that is the moment at which I was truly hooked. What I found astonished me. What I found told me that even 300 years ago, which is a really short span of time, Kolaba was a very unpromising area. Two uninviting islands, Old Woman's Island and the island of Kolaba, swamp, mosquitoes, jackals, mangroves, uh, rocks, nothing that would ever give you a hint of what it would once become, what it would one day become. Using old histories, old travellers' accounts, old Times of India directories, I gradually cobbled together the story of how this swamp, marsh, rock place became what is today one of the most eccentric, quirky and multicultural neighbourhoods in the country. And uh, But this talk of mine is not about Kolaba, it is not about my book. It is really about the lessons I have been learning since I started that excavation into the past, since I started peeling back the past layer by layer. My first surprise actually came very early on when I returned to the two really basic facts that we know about our city, about Mumbai. Whenever I go to a school, I ask the children, what are the two things you know about Mumbai? And sure enough, they will come up with these. One, that Mumbai was built out of seven islands. Two, that Mumbai was handed over as dowry by the Portuguese when Queen Catherine married King Charles of Britain. This is something you all know. Fact or fiction? Let's look at it a little. Anyway, so my big question when I started the book was, okay, where is Kolaba? Where does Kolaba begin? Where does Kolaba end? And what is the line that separates it from the rest of the city? I started, of course, by going to the, the conventional obvious sources, the BMC, the police, the post office. But it soon became apparent that these institutions have divided up the city more for convenience rather than local history. I would have to look at other places. It was then, I think, that I had my aha moment. It struck me that Mumbai, Bombay, was once seven islands. How difficult can it be to hunt for that island of Kolaba? All I have to do is dig beneath the concrete, the garbage heaps, the potholes and memory and find my island. So, I did what? I guess most people would. I went to the library and started looking at old maps. The first map I found was a map that said it was a map that reflected Bombay in 1670. Now, this is a familiar piece of cartography. It looks like an arrangement of little amoeba-shaped islands, sort of in a thin, narrow triangle. Something we've all seen, something that deeply impacts our view of our city. Okay, I was very comfortable with this. So imagine my astonishment when the next map I found was a map drawn in 1672, just two years later, by a man named Dr. John Fryer. John Fryer was a doctor with the East India Company. He had come to India uh, to treat the East India Company people and he drew a map that was totally unfamiliar. Now his map and the other map only two years apart. So it was impossible to imagine that geography could have changed so much. So what explained the fact that he had clustered all the five islands on top, Mahim, Masgao, Parel, Worli and Bombay as one single blob, one landmass. It made no sense at all. It took months of research actually to understand what was behind this. And we go back to this entire business of the dowry. When we are told that an island is handed over as a dowry by one power to another, we assume that it is a very celebratory and civilized affair. Not in the least. When the British arrived, when Sir Shipman arrived in Bombay with his 400 men to claim the new British property, he found Portuguese settlers who were reluctant, who were enraged that they were pawns in a game of matrimonial chess. What the hell? They enjoyed their status as top dogs in Bombay. They loved their houses, their gardens, their lovely life. 
they were not going to part with a single square inch extra. Now, to this already complicated situation was the added inconvenience that King Charles, who was by all account a very distracted and skirt-chasing ruler, had lost his map of his dowry. So who is to know what is Bombay? Now, the British said that if you can walk from one place to another, that constitutes a single landmass. The Portuguese said if you need a boat to go from one place to another, that means it's an island. The Portuguese said all you get is that single egg-shaped island. The British said, no, all the five islands on top are ours. Now, who was right and who was wrong? Bombay didn't make it any easier to get, it didn't throw up any answers. Do you know why? For the simple reason that the islands that constitute our city were linked by a strange relationship. During low tide, the sea retreated leaving behind swamp and wetland, and it was actually possible to walk all the way from Kolaba up to Basin. During high tide, though, the sea came rushing in, as one writer described it, with the, the energy of a young colt. And at that point, you needed boats to go from one place to another. Who was right, the Portuguese or the British? And what was right? Is Bombay Seven Islands? Is it a single landmass? I think these are all questions that remain to be answered. Even more intriguing for me was actually the provenance of that first map. See, the map of 1670 with the seven islands. The Portuguese hadn't drawn it. So where did that come from? This is even more bizarre. In the 19th century, there were a whole bunch of British intellectuals and newspaper editors, uh, novelists, who became fascinated by the local history of the city. By this point, reclamation was uh, everywhere. The original contours of our city were invisible. What these guys did is they went to listen to the Maharashtrian Barkers. They started investigating the meaning of names of places, Umar Khadi, Pai Doni. And from those fragments, they created in their minds a sense of what the city must be. So the map that you and I believe to be the map of our city was actually built not on fact, not on measurement, but again on the shifting sands of an unpredictable sea and memories. One little aside before I go to the next point, when I did look at the maps, I realized to my shock and horror that I am actually not a Kulaba Kar. I am an old woman Kar because my house sits on old woman island and I will have none of that. But, yes, it's a very tricky business, the business of identity. When we overturn something we have held so true and believed so deeply, I think it throws up a lot of questions. So much of our sense of self, so much of our identity, so much of our entire business of us versus them depends on these stories and histories that we have grown up with. If these are not to be relied upon, if these are to be questioned, then what are we basing our beliefs on? It is something we all need to think about all the time. More revelations were coming along the way. I had grown up with stories of the Kolaba railway station, about how wonderful trains chugged all the way from northern India right to the very tip of our city. I had grown up with this famous family story of how my grandfather and his friends must have been about 12-year-olds at that point, saw a train heading to Surat, jumped on without informing their families and caused widespread pandemonium in the local Mura community, as you can imagine. What I never thought to ask is where exactly was Kolaba railway station? Now, though, I wanted to find out. I started asking a whole bunch of old timers. And strangely, their responses were vague, imprecise, contradictory. And again, it alarmed me that, you know, something so basic as the location of a major landmark has been forgotten in less than 100 years. Again, it throws up questions about what we remember and what we forget. It was finally when I contacted a railway historian that I got my answer and one that left, left me absolutely gobsmacked. I mean, I was literally like this because I realized that Kolaba station was the view outside my window. 
where, where now I can see a wall, a shed, Bogan Villa flowers, a coppersmith bird, AC wires, whatever. So all of these stories, I think, have filled me with a real sense of uncertainty about our entire belief system. Now, the Kolaba railway station again led me to another really interesting fragment about the past of our city. Around Kolaba railway station and in Kolaba was the cotton green. Why is this important? Because the cotton green was the place where untold wealth entered the city in the 1860s. In 1861, when the American Civil War started, uh, the American South signaled their aggression by, by burning millions of bales of cotton. What were they trying to tell the world? They were saying, if you want our cotton, you will stand with us. The world refused to stand with them. It was a moral <laughs> battle. They could not do this. The outcome was a worldwide cotton famine, a real starvation, especially for the huge mills of Britain, huge gobbling uh, uh, sort of factories which needed their cotton on a daily basis. The British looked elsewhere for cotton. They looked at uh, Persia. They looked at Egypt. And of course, they looked at India. And the short staple cotton that everybody had sneered at for so long suddenly became the hottest commodity. And all of these transactions were taking place on the cotton green of Kolaba, where actually I realized that my building probably stands. <coughs> It, the cotton fever was so great at that point that people were literally dragging their mattresses from home, ripping them apart and selling a few handfuls of cotton. Do you have any sense of how much money entered the city in those days? 80 million pounds. And it is that money that has created the Bombay, the Mumbai we know. It has given us electricity, it has given us drainage, and it has given us a sense of ourselves. All of this, I think, was fascinating, but again reminded me that my identity as a Kolabaka, or as an old woman kar, if you prefer, is a composite one. It links with all manner of uh, other stories, with the Koli fishermen who lived there long before I did, with the slaves toiling in America, with Scarlett O'Hara from Gone with the Wind, with the Sufi saints who, for some un- inexplicable reason, travelled all the way to India, parked in the rocky Kolaba, lived here and died here and have left behind little shrines along the southernmost tip of our city. And of course, with the Sinti community who entered our city, soon after this cotton green was closed down, they came into Mumbai, they came into Bombay and found empty tracts of land and a welcoming air because Kolaba has always been welcoming of differences. And many moved to Kolaba and became a part of my story the way I am part of their story. I think learning about the past grants any patch of land, even the most ordinary and boring patch of land, with a touch of magic, a touch of meaning. When I hop out of my house to go to the laundry, or to buy Azitral for a sick daughter, I sometimes see a glimmer of the Mumbai, the Bombay, that Mark Twain wrote about in 1895. He said, it is a bewildering city, a bewitching city, an enchanting city. And Arabian nights come again. I can hear the travellers of past yammering in my ear about snakes and churches, about the hungry cemetery of Mendham's Point, about Armenian highwaymen shooting the ear of Mrs. Parrow's carriage driver. I can, when I walk along Kolaba, I know when I am stepping off my island and when I am walking on water, which, if you are a Mumbaikar, is actually very, very surprisingly often. More than anything, though, I think I have realized that just as no man is an island, no island is an island. We are all connected by our histories and our geographies. Thank you.